Hello everybody and thank you for joining me on another edition of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Before I get started on this one, I have to give a huge thank you to Leah. Leah contacted me. She sent me an email full of information about this case. She had a bunch of research links. We're going to go over a few of those here. Um, quite frankly, this could almost be a full-blown um, episode of Brain Scratch, but I thought it was really important to put it in the Searchlight format because of the three theories that I think we're going to be left with by the end, um, I, I personally like to think that there's a very good chance that this young woman here, Erica Lynn Parsons, um, might still be alive and might be able to be found. Now, if that name doesn't ring a bell, um, this has been a very big case. It came to the surface in uh, 2013 and was featured on the Dr. Phil show. I believe Nancy Grace did some coverage on it as well. So it got a lot of national coverage. But as sometimes happens with these cases, it seems to have kind of fallen by the wayside over the past few years, even though there are a few small news tidbits to um, go over. So I'll definitely be sure to hit those with you by the end of the video. But let's um, take a look at this case and do realize Dr. Phil did uh, two episodes on this. You can find it on YouTube. I'm actually going to include the link in the description box below, but as usual, I put it there with a grain of salt because sometimes uh, those links don't work by the time uh, some of the viewers get to them. But um, it is a very compelling double episode of Dr. Phil. There is a ton of information to go over in the way that that's presented. I'm going to focus a bit more on the missing person aspect of it, although I will touch on the overall story about what, what happened around this case as well. So these are photos of Erica Lynn Parsons. And this is an age progression. Um, this is age progressed to age 17. So basically this was done last year. She would now be a year older than this. Um, we can see this is from uh, charlieproject.org. Once again, huge shout out to Charlie Project. I just really appreciate how they put all this information together. Um, Erica has been missing since November 19th, 2011 from Salisbury, North Carolina. Um, she is in the classification of being endangered missing. Uh, she was born February 24th, 1998. She was 13 years old at the time she went missing. She is four and a half, uh, four foot five, actually less than four and a half feet tall, 85 pounds. So um, for her age, it was noted that she is extremely small in stature. Um, distinguishing, distinguishing characteristics, Caucasian female, brown hair, brown eyes, clothing and jewelry description, shorts and a red sweatshirt with a snowman on the front, medical conditions, Erica is learning disabled and has hearing problems. She is classified as a special needs child. I think that's going to come into one of the theories I present uh, by the end of the episode. So let's go into the details of disappearance. And this is where things already begin to get very weird. Erica was reported missing by her adoptive brother, William James Parsons. He last saw her at their home in the 200 block of Miller Chapel Road in Salisbury, North Carolina on November 19th, 2011. He reported her disappearance on July 30th, 2013, 20 months after he last saw her and shortly after his parents forced him to leave their house. James stated whenever he asked where Erica was, their parents, Casey Stone Parsons and Sandy Wade Parsons Sr. told him she was staying with relatives. Photographs of Casey and Sandy are posted below this case summary. Uh, James said he became suspicious of their story, and after his own attempts to locate his sister came to nothing, he went to the police. Casey and Sandy, who have five biological children in addition to Erica, told police they believed Erica was staying with her biological family. So, um, to start with, Erica was actually a niece of this couple, of Casey and Sandy. Um, and from what I understand, um, Sandy's brother was married to a woman. The woman had cheated on him, had Erica, and because of that, um, neither of those parents uh, seemed to want to keep her, so they put her up for adoption, and the uh, brother or brother-in-law, um, Sandy, and his wife, Casey, decided to adopt Erica at that point. 
So already a bit of a rough start for this poor young girl. And then of course, when you consider that she's also special needs on top of that, there's just a lot going on uh, with this case already. Now, very interesting twist in terms of the brother. You have this brother that gets kicked out of his family's house and he's a biological son to these parents. And then um, essentially kind of rats them out, comes out with this information that, hey, uh, my adoptive sister has been missing for uh, 20 months now. Things seem to escalate very quickly from here. Um, if I got the dates right, they're on the Dr. Phil show, I think within a month of this happening, and uh, a lot of other troubles start to begin for them after that. Now, I did watch both of the episodes of Dr. Phil today, um, and you know, when you're seeing the parents interviewed, um, Dr. Phil does a very good job of asking some very pointed questions. And the story the parents are giving is that about six months before her disappearance, uh, Mother Casey was contacted on Facebook by someone proclaiming to be Erica's grandmother. This woman's name was Irene Goodman. Uh, we do know that her biological father's last name was Goodman, so that would seem to be a potential match for a relative. Um, she insisted on being called Nan, and over the course of a few months communicating on Facebook and apparently a few phone calls, uh, Casey became comfortable enough with Nan to allow Erica to meet her, and not only meet her, but go and spend weekends with her. Um, where it starts getting strange is they were allowing all this despite not knowing the address that Erica was going to, not knowing where this Nan person lived. Um, but they did apparently have some type of phone number and some type of Facebook contact with this woman and felt comfortable enough to allow all this. So November comes along, they agree to an extended stay for Erica with Nan, where she's supposed to stay with her for three weeks. And over the course of those three weeks, there's eventually a phone call where Nan is saying, you know, Erica wants to stay here longer. Um, and apparently the mother, Casey, is okay with this. And I mean, just retelling it, I'm starting to get, you know, hairs rising on the back of my neck. There are so many things about this story that just sound extremely odd. You're talking about a mother of six kids in total between her five biological kids, this one adopted one. Um, this seems like extremely risky behavior. This is a person she only met online within the past six months. Um, there, it appears that she didn't do anything to truly validate this woman. Investigators that have looked into this case um, found out that Erica's biological father, um, his mother actually died in 2005 and has been long gone and her name was not Irene. So none of the story seems to be matching up about this person being a legitimate family member. However, throughout this entire two episodes of Dr. Phil, Casey is sticking to her guns that she still doesn't fear for Erica's life in any way because she is with her grandmother. She knows it's her grandmother. Uh, and there is even a segment where um, Dr. Phil uses his resident um, lie detector. Um, oh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I actually have been in the audience several times for the Dr. Phil show and I, oh, Tremarco, Jack Tremarco. I got to talk to him once. Very, very nice guy. Um, very, uh, open and you know he basically seemed like he would answer any question you asked him um, but he, the parents agreed to do a lie detector test on the Dr. Phil show then when they went backstage things kind of got a little weird which if you watch the show you know sometimes happens um, one of the qualifying questions is are you in any pain they have to do that before they actually give the test because if you're in pain that can skew the results the mother, Casey, had had surgery recently. She was on some type of medication. She said her pain was a nine out of 10. So it basically ruled her out of being able to take the lie detector test. The father, Sandy, did take the lie detector test. And essentially they only asked him two questions, which were both really asking the same thing. Uh, do you know anything about a plan for this girl's disappearance? and he failed both of those questions and failed them pretty miserably. As a matter of fact, by the end of the show, um, Dr. Phil is relaying all this to their attorney. They don't even show up to hear the results even though they are offered the chance to come back on the show and, and talk about the um, lie detector results. So, very strange. 
very mysterious, and essentially when they leave the Dr. Phil show and go home, all of a sudden their world gets turned completely upside down. Uh, FBI is raiding, uh, the State Bureau of Investigation is raiding their place. They're starting to collect evidence. They're taking out chunks of wall that have red, um, some type of red material on them, pieces of baseboard. Um, it's noted that some books on the John Benet Ramsey case actually show up and can be seen being removed by some investigators, which is uh, definitely a, a little odd. Um, but let's just hear what the brother had to say about the type of abuse that Erica was facing. Jamie Parsons testified that both his parents physically abused Erica and so did their children. He said Sandy punched Erica and Casey once broke the girl's fingers, bending them back as punishment. He testified that Erica had a bald spot on the top of her head where scabs had formed and healed from being struck in the head. Jamie said Erica ate from a dog bowl when not fed by her adoptive parents and that they locked her in a closet and left her behind when they went on vacations. Now another thing that comes out in the episode of Dr. Phil is um, they reached out to some family members to get their input and there was basically no family members that were supporting Sandy or Casey's position. There was a lot of family members chiming up that said, we thought that some type of abuse was going on. Um, as a matter of fact, no one uh, even saw Erica for a prolonged period of time before her supposed disappearance. I think it was April of 2011 is when an, an outside family member had last seen her. So it appears that this girl was going through some abuse. There had been a previous uh, period where um, Casey had actually given Erica to her sister to stay with her for about eight months. Uh, because she couldn't put up with her anymore, but then took her back because she was afraid of getting in trouble for still receiving um, some type of state assistance for this young woman, which is part of where their legal troubles continued. Speaking of their troubles, on August 27, 2013, Sandy and Casey Parsons moved to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Their two youngest biological children were taken away by the Department of Social Services shortly after the case began, and it is believed Erica must be found in order for them to be returned, though the parents visit their children every week. The two children have lived at various times with Robin Ashley, sister to Casey Parsons, and with William Steve Parsons and Janet Parsons, father and stepmother to Sandy Parsons. A custody hearing on September 11th, 2014 was expected to determine where the children would live. Um, you can see that on January 30th, the FBI offered a $25,000 reward in addition to the $10,000 offered by the sheriff. Six months later, the total reward increased to $50,000. Dr. Phil has also offered a $5,000 reward. So the main legal issue that these parents were now facing were that they actually kept collecting this state money that was supposed to be for Erica's care while they did not have Erica for, a, for this prolonged period of time. That turned into numerous counts, including some fraud charges, mail fraud, um, defrauding the state, and uh, many of those charges stuck. In essence, both those parents are now in prison uh, let's see here. On March 27, 2015, U.S. District Judge Thomas Schroeder sentenced Casey Parsons to 10 years and her husband to 8 years for fraud. Schroeder, quote, believes Casey was the brains behind what happened, end quote. And I have to say that there was this weird nagging feeling I kept getting while I was watching them being interviewed on the Dr. Phil show where it felt like Sandy, the husband, had deferred everything to his wife, Casey. He was trusting her uh, level of understanding of who this Nan woman was. Um, he says that Casey did all the transportation of taking Erica there. Um, he only went once, and that one time he went, he didn't even see this woman, Nan. Um, so there was this, this very rigid, hey, I have nothing to do with this, my wife was handling everything, that kept coming up throughout the episode as, as they were being interviewed, and I definitely found uh, quite a bit strange. Now, of course, at this point, you know, as soon as you mention John Benet Ramsey books being found in the house um, and them taking samples of, you know, bloody sections of wall, we have to consider the possibility that there might have been a murder of some kind. I did find this little tidbit. This is from the missingpersonsofamerica.com page on this case. Um, and they did a really good job of these updates down below where they have all the uh, critical information. But here's an update from August 22nd, 2013. 
a red wooden storage building located at the home on the 200 block of Miller Chapel Road was searched by authorities. The building belongs to Erica Parsons adoptive father, Sandy. The search warrant states that a hammer, pieces of a vacuum cleaner, a videotape, Erica's school records and teeth were seized during the search. Yes, teeth. Um, this is literally the only occurrence that I have found of anything that might potentially be a body part um, related to the original case. There has been some news recently where new people that are living at the house dug out a tree. Apparently some bones were found under that tree. Those bones were looked at and determined to be from some type of small animal, possibly a dog. But um, here we have no identification in terms of what type of teeth these were. Why are they inside of a wooden storage building? Um, however, I'd have to believe that the authorities would have tested these, try to determine if they're human or not. And if they were, I'm pretty sure the court cases would have take, taken a very different turn. The court cases are literally just fraud cases. The parents have not been named as suspects in terms of any murder related to Erica. And I'm hopeful that if the investigators were really doing their job, really combing through that scene, we know they had all the access they needed to try to find anything in there that might be related to uh, any type of murder investigation. They didn't. And I'm hopeful that that leads to a bit of a different theory. So let's talk about the other two remaining theories. Um, the first is that this Nan person was some type of con artist. Uh, maybe found out some information about the family through Facebook. There's a lot of mention of Facebook use in this case. Um, could have created this fake profile with the same last name as the biological father and kind of worked her way into this position of trust with Casey. Um, even going as far as grooming Casey further with those few short visits that she had with Erica, returning Erica safely. And then finally, um, when she was ready to ultimately disappear, made off with Erica. Um, at this point, I do think it's worth letting you guys know the phone number that Casey had to contact uh, Nan no longer works. At first it seemed like it was blocked, then the phone number was actually um, completely turned off. Now the phone number is being used by someone else completely unrelated to the case. The Facebook profile was deleted is the official story from Casey. Um, the impression I get from some of the things I've read are that the investigators don't really buy that. And I'd be very curious if the investigators tried to subpoena any of the records from Facebook showing the communication between Casey and Nan. Because um, if you want to really get to the truth of the matter, this whole story starts on Facebook. Um, I'm very familiar with IT technologies. No data is ever completely erased. You can always go to backups. You can always resurrect that information and take a look and see um, what happened at the time. So I haven't found any information to see if they've done that or not, but the investigators are very clear. They don't believe Casey's story about this Nan person whatsoever. And that brings me to my third theory. And I was, while I was watching the Dr. Phil episode, I kept waiting for this theory to come up. And the only hint of it came from Jack Tremarco at the very end when he was talking about his analysis about the parents lying. What if Casey and Sandy did all this in some effort to sell Erica to someone else? And I know that sounds a bit far-fetched initially, but let me give you some other pieces of information that fit into this story. At one point, Casey decided to be a surrogate mother for a couple that were trying to have a baby. The woman had a partial hysterectomy very early in life. Her and her husband wanted to have a baby. They hired Casey. Um, an egg was implanted in Casey, and then things apparently got pretty weird between Casey and the couples. She told the couples that she had miscarried six weeks after they implanted the embryo. Um, then the couple did some investigating and came to find out she was actually still pregnant. They believe she was trying to sell the baby that she was planning on having. They said that they found at least two instances of different families that were talking to Casey in some way about acquiring this baby. Um, they hired a lawyer, did some legal intervention, and luckily they were able to get their child and their child is now living with them. But that does show some precedence here. Um, and that's not only, I mean, if you consider Casey was trying to have this baby and sell it to someone else, I'm sure she was already paid for trying to carry this baby. 
now she's essentially trying to double down on, on her money and make more money by possibly selling this baby on a black market of some kind. Then you consider the case with Erica, where Erica is not being cared for in their house, but she's still receiving over $600 a month from the state to take care of Erica. Um, it appears to me that this woman does a lot of funny money type things. So personally, where I'm at right now, after reviewing all this, we have a special needs kid. Um, she is very small in stature. It's possible that she could have been sold to someone else. Um, I don't know if the Nan character exists, but maybe part of the lies that Casey is telling us about that Nan character are actually true. Maybe she went to Facebook to try to find someone that was looking to complete their family by having a child of some kind, and she offered up Erica. Um, that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it right now and I'm hopeful that that's the case because ultimately that would at least give us a chance of finding Erica at some point in the future. Um, I believe that she wouldn't be going by Erica. They probably would have tried to condition her to not use that name any longer. She's a special needs child. I don't know what she was affected by um, but I, you know, I really have no way of knowing where her mentality was at. She's probably not even going by the correct age would be my assumption when you consider that she was smaller in stature. Quite honestly, from what I understand about adoption and what parents look for, it's much easier to adopt younger children. So I have a feeling Casey would have probably lied about her age when she was trying to uh, arrange this deal in the first place. Um, and that would also coincide with the lie detector results that we got from Sandy about there being some type of plan for Erica's disappearance that was put into play. So, man, that's uh, where I'm at with it. Outside of that, just a couple of small news updates. Oh, I also wanted to point out a candyrose.com. This website has really gone in depth into this case. You can find um, timelines of just about every blip on social media that might or might not even be related to this case. Tons of information. If you're really interested in jumping into the dirty details, this is the place to do it, a candyrose.com. Um, if you do a quick Google News search on Erica Parsons, you will see a couple of recent articles. Um, as I mentioned, animal bones were found um, where they thought it might have been Erica's bones. That was just November 2nd of 2015. Um, here we see that her father in August of 2015 was charged with trespassing. Apparently he went to a hospital where he was told not to go back to that hospital. That's about all that I could get from the news article. There's not a whole lot of detail about why he was originally asked to not go back to that hospital anymore, but they charged him with trespassing. And then unfortunately, January 15th of 2016, he actually dies. Billy Dean Goodman uh, was his name. They believe that it was just uh, natural causes. I believe he was homeless at the time or living at a shelter of some kind. Um, seems like he had some pretty rough stumbles towards the end of his life there. If I recall right, he's 51 years old at the time that he passes. But outside of that, not a whole lot of current news. A little blip on the John Benet Ramsey books being found, but that was in November of 2015. And this is where I turn it over to you, my wonderful Brain Scratch Searchlight audience. Um, quite honestly, if this girl was sold, I don't know where she would be in this country. She could be in North Carolina, she could be in some neighboring state, she could be in Las Vegas. I really have no idea. So um, please do me a favor, check into the details in the description box below. You can go through these links, learn about this case yourself. Uh, share it with friends. I think the, the best thing we can do are get as many eyes as possible on these pictures here, particularly this one, and just know that this girl might be out there, um, might not be listed as Erica Lynn, uh, might not even have the proper age attached to her, um, but I think there's a very good chance that she's out there somewhere waiting to be discovered. Um, and thankfully, if she is, I'm pretty sure she won't be going back to that house. It sounds like it was a very horrible place to be. One more time, thank you, Leah, for sending me this case and all of the information around it. I truly, truly appreciate it, and I hope the rest of you are having a wonderful week. I will catch you on the next show on the Geek and Dorks channel. Take care. <laughs>